surrealistic golden sand sculptures, the highest dunes on earth. Their black shadowed windswept forms soaring skyward reflect this country's magnificent kaleidoscope of awe-inspiring contrasts. This is Wildland Namibia. Solitary tracks across the parched wasteland are a stark reminder that water is life. Ironically, this weird, waterless world is battered along its western boundary by the bitterly cold Atlantic Ocean. Yet the dew formed during the chilly nights is the only regular moisture suitable to sustain land life. Throughout the centuries in this spectacular wilderness, life of necessity has been governed by an interminable search for water. Life of necessity has been a nomadic adventure. Majestic Hemsbok, resplendent in desert-toned garb, search out the meager vegetation that is available. Then, like generations before them, they wander off into the unknown in search of pastures new. The Narbib, the Hottentot word for desert, stretches over a thousand kilometers northwards from the Orange River, the formidable dunes forming a Herculean barrier between the tumultuous sea and the desolate interior. Barren branches, half buried in the parched sand, seem to epitomize nature's eternal struggle for survival, a struggle which is often lost. Miraculously, amid the desolation hidden beneath rocky outcrops, lie occasional small pools of subterranean water, spotlighted by the sun. Even these welcome springs provide scant relief in a scorched environment. The sun-baked sand offers a hostile home to any life form. But those which have survived successfully are gloriously displayed against the sterile backdrop. Where life cannot be supported, the sand produces its own spectacular desert roses, salts transformed into magnificent crystalline clusters by the intense heat. Abruptly, the sandscape ends, and like a hand-drawn contour line, a dried-up riverbed provides a boundary to the curious lunar-like desert mountain region, forbidding yet fascinating. To add to the cosmic illusion, well, witchier sprawl at intervals like weird hybrids from another planet. Indeed, although common here, they are found in no other place on Earth. These queer coniferous fossils, directly related to the pine family, can live to be 2,000 years old. Their single pair of broad leaves, sometimes nine meters long, drape cunningly to protect their roots from the relentless sun. Seemingly in defiance of the eerie habitat, their quiet splashes of scarlet brighten the monochrome scene. In reality, the color attracts a particular species of beetle found only in the Namib to pollinate the male and female plants. Seed heads bursting with new life stretch out of crevices in the ancient petrified trees, which failed in their own bid for survival and were swept into the area by floodwaters millions of years ago. The very elements which caused their demise have miraculously transformed them into spectacular stone replicas of their former glory. Fabulous forgotten forests, probably from Central Africa, are conserved for eternity far from their original home.
florid, parched, and occasionally polka dotted with clumps of perennial grass, the bleak beauty of the desert's eastern escarpments has little sustenance to offer wandering beasts. Fortunately, sporadic limestone outcrops on the lower slopes support a sparse savanna type vegetation which provides welcome food for the migrant population. It is truly incredible that these desert elephants have adapted to such an arid lifestyle. Lush, food-filled tropical rainforests are the natural habitat for this species, just the opposite to conditions here. Creatures of all sizes seek out the more hospitable environment of the camel thorn felt along the intermittent watercourses. This both provides them with nourishment and affords them protection from the piercing rays of the midday sun. To cool himself down, a young elephant relishes a brief dust bath before trundling wearily off to find his family and resume his journey once more. heat begins to play games with the eye. The meandering nomads assume an ethereal quality as they drift regally in and out of a shimmering watery haze, an illusion which is compounded by swaying wisps of grass. The old adage, adapt or die, is extremely relevant here. To survive, all living creatures have been forced to adapt to the incredibly high temperatures, to the scarcity of water, to the lack of food. An acacia copse provides temporary respite for the small herd of well-adapted desert elephants. Feeding selectively off the few struggling trees, they ensure that sufficient foliage remains for the plants to survive. Their jungle cousins, by comparison, would uproot whole trees without a second thought. Until recently, it was rumoured that the desert elephant was being threatened with extinction, driven off by severe drought, killed off by poachers. Speculation was rife. Certainly, their bid for survival in the last decade has been arduous, but fortunately for the relentless pachyderms, Damara land is also a region of sharp contrasts. In the blink of an eye, the thornbush felt gives way to mountainous dolomite terrain. Suddenly, a refreshing spring where life is abundant. Above the water, a basking dragonfly. Below, like an effervescent cool drink, beetles bubble up and down, creating isolated ripples on the glass-like surface above. Reflected in the water, the endless azure of a cloudless Namibian sky. Elegant palms provide welcome shade for two young bull elephants. Weary after a night's travel, they greet one another, entwining their trunks enthusiastically, a tradition among family members who have been separated for several days. Oozing down their massive cheeks, the highly pungent sticky liquid emitted from their swollen temporal glands leaves prominent black lines on their encrusted skin indicating that they are in must. The formalities of reunion aside, it is time to wash away the day's grime and settle down to an early morning drink. What a queer spectacle these creatures make, an archaic remnant from a prehistoric era. Certainly they do not appear to have changed significantly since they were hunted by the Stone Age Bushmen. On cliff faces and in caves in Damara land, some of the finest examples of Bushman art provide a living record of life over thousands of years.
the engravings, simple outlines, were apparently part of a hunting ritual involving sympathetic magic. Before a hunt, pictorial representations of the prey would be etched into the rock. Arrows shot at the drawings during an invocation ceremony would determine which area of the animal should be targeted. Most engravings depict defenseless game, but enormous beasts such as rhinoceros and giraffe also feature. Incredibly, the pygmy bushmen used only bows and arrow to kill these huge animals. Did they invoke supernatural powers? Hunting predators in this way certainly seems foolhardy, but they succeeded. But some engravings defy all explanation. These curious forms are absolutely identical to recent UFO sightings reported locally traversing the night sky. Did the ancient Bushmen have a similar encounter and regard them as omens to assist them with a successful hunt? The paintings, the decorative form of Bushman art, are not considered to be ritually symbolic. Animals and people are easily recognizable, but some mystery still exists. Is the White Lady of Brandberg descended from an Egyptian dynasty? Or is she actually a male Bantu initiate? Who knows? Away from the mysterious mountains, it's back to the present, battling once again with the elements. Stinging, blinding sand whipped up by a relentless afternoon wind drives its way into every crevice. At a distance, a grey-veiled mist rises ominously from the ground, pre-warning of the inevitable onslaught. The weary traveller does not welcome the incessant biting barrage by the sand, but to discover a dry, crazed riverbed with curled clay platelets rising up where there should be water is totally devastating. Fortunately, the gathering storm clouds bode well. Miraculously, in this land of violent extremes, the parched watercourse can, within the hour, be filled to capacity. Oh, what joy! Present-day bushmen, like their ancestors before them, are ecstatic at the sudden abundance of water. These fascinating people of tiny stature an adult is only 1.4 meters tall, basically still live by tradition. A complex arithmetical game using pieces of limestone has always been a popular pastime among the young men, who while away many an afternoon engrossed in its intricacy. Yet of necessity, these people are having to adapt to 20th century ways. Handcrafting mementos for the tourist industry provides an essential income. Ironically, as the craftsman busily burns an engraved design into the wood to impress visitors, he sits under a tree on which one such visitor to the area early in the last century engraved his name. A Bushman child oblivious of the historic graffiti is dwarfed by the ancient baobab as he clambers excitedly to collect fruit or honey from a hive hidden in its branches. With its dense foliage and bell-shaped flowers, which are a favorite with local bees, this magnificent tree provides copious shade for the transient group. It also bears an edible fruit, which the Bushmen regard as a particular delicacy. <laughs> White puffballs spew out of the fruit as its hard shell is broken open. Dressed in their beaded finery for a special clan gathering, the sweet and sour titbits are passed around. Everyone seems to enjoy this prized delicacy, which is in fact cream of tartar. Modern-day Bushmen still consult an oracle before a hunt 
in much the same way as their Stone Age forebears. In a traditional ritual, the bones determine which animals should be hunted and where they will be found. Although some hunters also carry a throwing stick to knock down birds and small mammals, bows and arrows remain the favoured weapons. These people are phenomenal trackers. They don't need footprints or droppings to follow the game. A bent leaf or a strand of hair will tell them immediately what has passed by and when. The handmade arrows carried carefully in a quiver are often poison tipped. The essence of hunting for the bushman is the adaption to nature and the mastery of it, just as it always has been. At the end of a successful day, it's time for celebration and a ritual to invoke their ancestors. The frantic shaking of the buttocks tightens the muscles in their backs, inducing an hypnotic trance. In this state, the Bushmen believe that they can communicate with their forefathers. These naturally happy folk need little excuse to laugh, dance and sing, and the festivities will usually continue until sunrise. As the new day dawns, the mutterings of a male lion unnerve potential prey who are intent on seeking an early morning drink. A herd of zebra listened carefully before deciding if the predator is serious. then suddenly hears the menacing noise. Is that a hungry cry? The wildebeest decide not and continue down to the water hole. The threat from the lion seems to have subsided, but all the beasts remain alert to potential danger. Stealthily, another hunter is approaching, but the wily jackal is only really a threat to smaller mammals. The kudu and Hemsbach are probably quite safe, as indeed is the giraffe. But the ground squirrel would make a tasty morsel for breakfast. Wisely they decide to burrow for safety. A bat-eared fox curiously surveys the scene as he returns home after his nocturnal exploits. A giant bull elephant is far too imposing to consider, so the jackal decides to try his luck elsewhere.
using his enormous trunk to suck up many liters of water at a time, this stately beast savors the leisurely drink. His broken tusks are witness to previous more difficult searches for water. Elephants are known to seek out dry riverbeds during a drought and bore down to the water table for a drink, but such activities leave their scars. From a treetop vantage point, a tawny eagle flexes his wings, ready for action. Meanwhile, a myriad of other exotic birds search out food before the heat becomes too intense. The northwest area of Namibia abounds with wildlife of every description and vegetation is more lush than in the desert region. A grove of moringa trees is known locally as the haunted forest. Legend has it that these odd specimens fell out of the sky, landing upside down, with the root structures exposed above the ground. It is not difficult to understand why this is believed. This is the area of the Atosha Pan a flat-bottomed salt pan fringed by grassy plains and woods, which in the rainy season swells to a vast inland lake. There are almost as many myths about Etosha as there are species of animals within it. Here, Food and water are more plentiful, but so are the predators. This herd of elephant anticipate a problem. They raise their trunks vertically using their sense of smell to locate the danger. The larger adults surround the young to protect them, extending their large ears to appear even more imposing and deter anything threatening the herd. more enthralling experiences and nowhere in the world can compete with the Tosha which offers a fascinating variety of watering places where different types of wildlife congregate to drink. There is a strong spring at Ombika and just about every type of animal in Atosha can be found drinking there at some time. At Okakuyu, Hemsbok, Springbok, Zebra and Elephant abound. Sometimes up to 1,500 animals a day drink there. The presence of this nocturnal predator causes some disturbance. This is indeed a rare experience. A young leopard venturing out to drink by day. He seems to be enjoying a drink quite inoffensively. 
even the giant elephant is alarmed. This is obviously an extraordinary occasion. Quick glance at the massive frame approaching, and the leopard decides to head for home. Maybe sleeping by day is a better policy after all. Content that he has performed a useful service to the community, the bull elephant rewards himself with a well earned mud bath. seems rather small for his enormous frame, but this is a resourceful beast. Elephants abound in Namibia, so it is not surprising that they are chosen as models by local sculptors. The tools may be primitive, but the carvings produced are magnificent. Kavango village is a hive of activity. Young girls under the supervision of an elder undertake the daily task of grinding sweet corn to make flour. and a single furrow plough may seem primitive to an outsider. But this metal plough is considered a high-tech piece of equipment by these industrious people. Alongside the settlement, another stark contrast, as the Kavango River comes down in flood, gushing over the Purple Falls. A cormorant with detached amusement watches the local fishermen in their makoro as they set off in search of a catch, attempting to negotiate the dense water lily beds. Difficult still is manoeuvring around the live, bulky obstacles which lurk out of view, such as a group of half-submerged hippos. Home to a magnificent spectrum of bird species, the Kavango Caprivi region is an ornithologist's paradise. Following the fish eagle's lead, the cormorant swoops low over the water, 
demonstrating that their method of fishing is far easier and less hazardous than man's. Along the water's edge, evening is fast approaching. A roan antelope ventures out casually for an early supper, seemingly unaware that he has been declared an endangered species and that he is providing onlookers with a rare sighting. The shores soon become alive with animals quenching their thirst after a long, hot day. Time to take one's ease and meet up with the rest of the family before dark. But not everything goes to sleep. The night air is filled with mysterious calls. As dawn breaks once more, the flat grassy plains of the Kawakafelt contrast distinctly with the rugged mountains beyond. Vegetation here is sparse. A few shallow-rooted trees, which have somehow adapted to the terrain, stand out like obelisks. It is really quite extraordinary that such a variety of plants do survive in these arid conditions and produce such vividly coloured flowers. Cacti, too, with their inbuilt resistance to drought, also colour the scene. Just as the animals have adjusted to desert conditions, so too have others adapted to the craggy, mountainous environment. Kudu clamber up and down steep rocky slopes with remarkable ease and are very sure-footed. Clipspringer are purpose-built for the terrain. Translated, their names mean rock jumpers and that is precisely what they do with outstanding agility. Like sentinels, baboons perch high on the mountain tops, barking a warning at intervals if they spot intruders. Even the mountain zebra, a large animal to negotiate such craggy highland, trots nimbly up the steep slopes. The splendor of a hidden mountain pool, with its emerald surround, is all the more impressive because of its isolation. Amid it all, the incredulous Fish River Canyon gapes like an open wound in the Earth's crust. Its sheer sides fall almost vertically to the river far below. A hostile environment, but a few rock lizards seem to enjoy the solitude. The river comes down in flood, a bubbling, muddy torrent taking with it any obstacle that stands in its way. Valleys echo once more to the joyous sound of burbling water. The Overhimba are thrilled to have somewhere to water their goats.
These are a race of herdsmen with a proud tradition. They hold their heads up high, making little or no concession to westernization or the 20th century. The chief, with poised dignity, sits before the sacred fire, surveying activities in the kraal, as young girls, their bodies gleaming with red ochre, set off to collect water. In 1853, Charles Anderson, the Scandinavian explorer, reported, these people smoke a pipe of dacha, it makes them very happy. They still enjoy a pipe today. Indeed, seeing the Overhimba now is like a glimpse of the Africa first seen by the early adventurers. Unspoiled, authentic. The women's traditional headdress is made from the scalp of a sheep or goat, but a favorite ornament is the large white shell worn around the neck which originates from the East African coast. As they display their intricate jewelry, they are dignified and proud. They take particular pride in their immaculately dressed locks of hair, which are worn at the back of the head only when the woman has reached marriageable age. A bleak, eerie graveyard is testament to the ritual of Overhimba burial. The skulls of cattle, which have been slaughtered during a protracted funeral ceremony, are hung high in the trees as a mark of respect. A macabre scene. Even the trees are lifeless. In contrast, tall green-fringed palms sway majestically over another monument, an abandoned fort. This has an uncanny beau geste quality. It stands in memory of the German troops who assisted their countrymen to colonize Namibia at the end of the last century. It is deserted now, as indeed are so many settlements which previous inhabitants have been forced to leave, unable to survive in the harsh conditions. They came to this part of the world to seek their fortune in the inhospitable wilderness of the desert when minerals were unexpectedly discovered. An obituary on a wall reads, No rain, no wealth. We abandon ye therefore to the sun, the sand, and the flies. At Kolmanskop, the sand whipped by the interminable wind wasted no time in taking over. Once an active community lived and worked here, but the diamonds ran out as unexpectedly as they had been discovered, and with no other feasible way to make a living, the inhabitants departed. Now the eerie ghost town is totally deserted, homes and equipment abandoned to the elements. The town was named after a transport rider, Coleman, who was forced to abandon his wagons here when they were buried in a sandstorm. Surely this should have been an omen. Ultimately, the town has shared the same fate, being gradually covered by the encroaching sand dunes. When the wind whistles through the decaying buildings, one imagines that phantom voices from long ago are whispering a warning. Paradoxically, as barren as the coastal desert is, so in contrast is the ocean that beats on its shores wonderfully abundant with marine life. It is beyond comprehension. The cold Benguela current stirs up the nutrients from the ocean depths, starting off a great food chain. 
Thousands of excited birds swoop down in a frenzy of expectation as shimmering shoals of fish swim by. A treasury of fish has abounded along this coast for centuries, but until quite recently, it was exploited only by the birds and marine mammals. During 1487, Bartholomew Diaz, the Portuguese explorer, landed near Angra Pequena, now Luderitz Bay, and set up a monumental cross to commemorate his visit. Although he made several trips to the West African coast in the late 15th century, it was immediately after this one that he became the first navigator in history to round the Cape of Good Hope. These early adventurers named this treacherous shore the Skeleton Coast. And a quick glance out to sea explains why. Wrecks of ships run aground on the rocks appear and disappear with the tide. They are now only home to the multitude of seabirds. Innumerable colonies of seals form a mobile black mass writhing in the water and on the rocks. They have an easy life here and obviously enjoy the luxury of the well-stocked larder. During the 16th and 17th centuries, the seals were hunted for their skins and for their meat. The notorious Captain Kidd was among the sealers who operated along this coast. Fortunately these days, seal hunting is unpopular, and these playful creatures, whom ancient mariners often mistook for mermaids, can breed prolifically. Their natural predators are few, so there is ample time to bask in the sun, play with mother, or take a leisurely swim. Long shunned by early seafarers, who knew that certain death awaited them if they were shipwrecked along the rugged shore, there can be few places in the world that can offer a more desolate view than the barren white wastes of the Namib coast. Wildland Namibia, bounded by the oldest desert in the world, full of mystery, myth and contrast, a truly incredible adventure.